afternoon. Uh, welcome to the first meeting of the CCS season. Um, I'm not quite sure when the next season will start off with this because the year is changing. But uh, never mind, this is uh, we've had our summer break, starting our new program today. Um, I, want to make, I should make an announcement at the end of this meeting about changes into this year's program. We don't bother with them now. So I'm happy to introduce David Parsons. Um, this is a professor at Salford University, involved with others in the history of telecommunications, communications, um, and he's going to tell us how telephones became bits of computers. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's been some time since I, oops, a bit of feedback here, stood at this um, podium addressing the Computer Conservation Society. Um, last time I did, uh, I was talking about the Emulet machine. Now then, much of the material that I'm going to use this afternoon has been funded through grants, which my colleague, who was going to be with me, Professor Lynch, and I have had from EPSRC. And we do roadshows, we do illustrated lectures, and I'll tell you a little bit more about those later, so I think you'll be interested in them. And um, whenever we do something like this, we have to put our uniform on. So we start to strip, because we often are out in schools, and um, we, um, all, in, all the ones who do the talks in the team have got these rather wonderful waistcoats. <laughs> <laughs> and we're required, when we're giving a talk, to wear our waistcoat. So, let me get the top button undone, and then I will bedeck myself. We have two ladies to thank for these waistcoats. My wife, who found the fabric, and one of our colleagues at the university, who in addition to being an absolutely outstanding academic, is a brilliant seamstress. So, right, I can now talk to you about <laughs> the history of communications from telephones to data communications networks. But I'm actually going to talk to you a little bit about some other background. Now, if this thing is gonna work, and I have some problems on some of the uh, phasing of this because I've mixed material from lots of different versions of PowerPoint. So I have to give an acknowledgement before we start. My colleague, Professor Lynch, who I work very closely with, who is the director of our Computer Networking and Telecoms Research Centre at the university, which I'm part of, he has uh, kindly allowed me to use a lot of the material that we have produced as part of the Partnerships for Public Engagement funded projects which he and I have been involved with over something like the past um, uh, four to five um, years. So much of the material you're going to see today we have produced to use for our presentations on the Partnerships for Public Engagement talks and if you want to know what they're like it's a little bit like um, the Royal Institution lectures that we do. But I'm not going to get you to come out here and do experiments this afternoon. But I am CRB checked so, I'm allowed to talk to children and, uh, and um, adults who uh, perhaps have difficulties. So that probably covers us all, so we'll be all right. Okay, this is an enormous subject, ladies and gents, and I'm only going to cover some aspects of it. For those of you who like to read up on some of these things, there are some very interesting books, and one in particular is the book From Semaphore to Satellite, produced on the occasion of the centenary of the ITU in 1965. And in the introduction, the Secretary General of the Society made this comment. Probably the most remarkable advance in the last hundred years lies in the speed and variety of our communications. The telegraph, the telephone, radio, broadcasting, television, and so on and so forth. I'm going to touch on some aspects of the telegraph, some aspects of the telephone. I'll skirt over radio and television very quickly and to talk about how the electronic revolution has virtually changed the way in which we communicate and the way in which our computer systems actually communicate. A book was produced which I purchased in the bookshop down the road um, here um, some time ago now, back in um, 1983, Telecommunications and Technology for Change. 
has changed the world, it says, beyond recognition since 1800. And if you want to, um, we were talking earlier about um, an academic background, I must recommend Laszlo Solnyar's book, Getting the Message, the past century has seen developments in communications probably unrivaled in any other field of human activity. Advances of a significant nature made every year critically influencing our, our lives. And um, uh, this is called A History of Communications. Professor Solmar is a um, uh, professor of engineering science at the University of Oxford. So it comes with a good pedigree, this one. But I often say to my students, Consider this statement, made in 1996 by the President of the World Future Society in his annual report. He said, the global network of interconnected computers and telecoms links in 1996 is already the biggest machine ever built. And it'll get bigger and more powerful and this monster machine will fundamentally transform human life as we know it today. Well, I think you'd probably agree with me that we could change that to 2009 and we could say the same thing. This monster machine of computers, the world's computers connected together by telecommunications things which we call the internet, is an enormous machine. It's an enormous resource and it gets more powerful as we speak. Since 1996 it has and will continue to get bigger and more powerful and it will continue to impact society. All aspects of society, wherever we are, the language we talk, our culture, our political systems, whatever they are, communications has been key to society and we have always exploited the technology of the time, of the day, to achieve communications over an ever increasing distance. And we call that subject telecommunications. So how did it all start? Well, basic communications, of course, started a long time ago. We can think of cave painting, communicating ideas and information. They're probably the earliest examples of non-verbal human communication. The Sumerians developed a long time ago the earliest form of handwriting. So what do we do today instead of handwriting? We have millions and millions of mobile phones. There are more mobile phones in this country than there are people. And we send millions and millions of text messages between individuals. And as individuals, we expect to be able to communicate over any distance. And how, so how have we achieved that over time? Let's start the history lesson. Well, it all first started using optical communications techniques. Here are some examples. Visual symbols, the smoke telegraphs around AD 150 used by the Roman military um, people. We have a lovely demonstration of this. We get kids up and we've got a, a Roman fort and we've got some simulated Roman torches and we get them sending all sorts of coded information. But visual symbols, and we continued to use visual symbols for many, many years. The early telegraphs were optical. Chappé's telegraph developed in France. <clears throat> Brilliant communication over 240 kilometers. You needed 15 towers to do it and the operators could get information from one end of France to the other in a very short space of time. George Murray in the UK developed the optical telegraph for the British Admiralty enabling us to communicate between London and the South Coast. And for those of you who are interested, there's an absolutely super book on these early mechanical um, telegraphs um, available, showing the developments of these things literally all over the world. But this was still communication by visual symbols. What we really needed was something that would work in all weathers and at any time of day. Signaling flags are very important, particularly to people like Nelson and his his colleagues, but if the weather was bad or if it was at night, you couldn't see anything. So what was really needed was something that would work at any time of day. So let's have a look around 1837, a bit before the telephone, I know, but things started to change. 
in 1837. Yes, Queen Victoria was on the throne, Lord Melbourne was Prime Minister, Charles Dickens was writing books like Oliver Twist, but there were a couple of other things that were going on because in 1837, we really still were doing a lot of our communication physically. We were sending the mail on coaches, we had started to see the arrival of the mechanical horse, the steam train. It was still important that we could communicate to, for our armed forces and we were still using the mechanical telegraph. But things were happening and this is what happened. The railway started to grow. Stockton and Darlington, Liverpool and Manchester and by 1837 there were 500 miles of rail in Britain and something was needed to enable them to be controlled in a proper way. And these two gentlemen set about solving the problem. Charles Wheatstone and William Cook started to use some of the developments in electricity and in July 1837 they managed over a distance of one and a half miles between Euston and Camden Town to transmit some messages by the needle telegraph using electricity. And those of you who've looked on the uh, web page about today will have seen a picture of the replica needle telegraph which Professor Lynch and I built to illustrate some of our um, uh, lectures. The needle telegraph works, of course, by having a set of five needles, and if you move them, the intersection of the two points, in this case the letter F, indicates the character that you wish to send. But the observant amongst you will realise that there are actually only 20 letters on the needle telegraph. There are six that are missing. We often ask the children to identify the letters that are missing as part of a, a quiz. But if we do the needles in another direction, of course we get W and that's how the needle telegraph operates. And it started to be adopted. The Great Western Railway adopted it between Paddington and West Drayton, 13 miles, cost them £3,270, and this is the sort of device that uh, uh, they were using. And it quickly became <coughs> useful for other purposes. Because at Paddington Station in 1845, a man wanted on suspicion of murder had boarded a train at Slough destined for Paddington. And they needed to get a description across the um, system. And the telegraph message was sent, but we don't have a letter Q on the five needle telegraph. And so the message that was sent said this, he is in the garb of a quacker, <laughs> as opposed to a Quaker. In any case, John Towell became known as the first man probably hanged by the electric telegraph. Of course, it was the telegraph system that became the fundamental contributor to the what we might call the Victorian internet. But while this was going on, of course, a well-known painter in the United States, Samuel Morse, was developing another system of communicating information, his Morse code, where he was granted his patent in 1840. And the first telegraph line was installed from Washington to Baltimore along the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad in 1840. And he sent his first message, What God Hath Wrought, in May 1844. And many of us will be familiar with the Morse code. And telegraph technology and Morse code effectively created the Victorian internet, we might say. And this is a picture of what the London Central Telegraph Office in 1874 looked like. Here is another interesting picture of a telegraph office. If I do that, that will highlight what the young ladies are wearing as fashion accessories on their feet at the time. You'll know they're roller skates. They had to move around between the incoming and outgoing machines so quickly that the fastest way of doing it was to wear roller skates. And this was typical of a telegraph office at the uh, time. And it grew very quickly. The Israeli government introduced a bill to acquire and maintain the work of the 
the electric telegraph in the UK and the growth figures were very impressive such that by 1872 we had nearly 88,000 miles of telegraph line operating over 5,000 telegraph stations in the UK alone and of course it started to go international in 1850 the line went across the channel to uh, France and the continent and in 1858 we managed to get the first transatlantic cable um, laid it didn't last very long as those of you who study these things know but it was the start of uh, direct communication across the vast expanse of the Atlantic Ocean but what else was going on while all these telegraphs were being developed two people Graham Bell, Alexander Graham Bell and Thomas Watson were experimenting with communicating the voice along wires as opposed to signals, dots and dashes. And on the 10th of March 1876, Alexander Graham Bell is reputed to have spoken by accident along their experimental telephone system saying, come here Mr. Watson, I need you and this uh, took place in Boston in 1876 and of course the development of that was that the human voice could then be transmitted over distance without the need for translation into codes such as the Morse code and not everyone was enthusiastic about it a Western Union memo penned in 1877 said this telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. The device is inherently of no value to us. And I'm sure we could all make wonderful quotations like some of the uh, famous ones, the CEO of DEC saying he couldn't understand why anybody would want a computer on their desk. Wanted Thomas Watson Sr. who said that these newfangled computer machines are all very well but I'm sure that IBM will not want to get out of the typewriter business. <laughs> so in any case, the telephone started to develop. Now let's just look at the telephone. If you've got um, a telephone, it's no good on its own. You need another telephone that you can talk to. And so there was a challenge. How do you actually talk between the telephone? How do you identify them? Well, of course, we number them, don't we? And when we make a, a call, we effectively make a, re a request that we want to call a particular phone, say phone 001 wants to talk to 332. We need somehow to make a connection. And so we are challenged with the requirement to connect calls and to switch the network between the calling and receiving instruments so that we can effectively get the two things talking together. And how was this achieved? Well, of course, it was achieved in the early days by these wonderful people, the human telephone operators. And that is how most of the calls were handled for many years. But then there's an apocryphal story leading to the development of automatic switching. Now, automatic switching has got two key requirements. Firstly, to make a call between two people, we do actually need a continuous link between those two people, those two points, the connection. And then we need to route it through many stages in order to reach the destination from the source. Take this number. It happens to be Professor Lindsay's number at the University of Salford. In today's numbering system, this of course is the country, 4-4, the United Kingdom. 0161 is the region, that's the Manchester region, 295 happens to be the exclusive telephone number for the University of Salford and that is uh, Professor Lynch's extension and we're all used to this. But of course in the early days the operators used to sit there and when the connection came up someone picked their receiver up, you'd hear number please and you had to tell them could you please get me through to Bradford 24225 or whatever whatever it is. And routing a telephone connection could potentially involve huge numbers of human operators. And the technical challenge was to route these calls automatically using machines. Now, enter an undertaker from Kansas, Alman B. Strouger. 
He was an undertaker, but most of you will have heard of the Strouger telephone equipment. Why did he develop it? Well, the story goes that one of his rivals in Kansas, who was an undertaker, was having a relationship, or was unmarried to, I don't know exactly the, the situation, to the telephone operator. And when someone in Kansas was picking up the telephone and saying, would you please connect me to the undertaker, they were being connected to Strouger's rival and not through to him, and he was losing business. And he thought, well, if we can eliminate these operators, maybe I can pick up some of the business. And so Almond B. Strouger developed the idea of giving telephones a dial of some kind, and we still talk about dialing, don't we? A dial is a circular thing, but we still talk about dialing when we're pressing our buttons. And he developed the Strouger switching system. So, for example, if we are going to dial telephone number five on the switch, which is an electromechanical series of, um, of uh, relays and selectors, when we dial the five on the telephone, we put our finger in it, it goes back, the, the, the switches clicks round five times and connects to the telephone that's connected to number five at, at the other end. And I'm sure you're all familiar with the basic principles of the electromechanical um, telephone switching system. And that lasted for a long, long time. In the UK, the first automated exchange based on Strouger opened in Epsom in 1912. And in 1958, still using Strouger equipment, the Queen formally opened what we now call STD, subscriber trunk dialing, and she made a call from Bristol to Edinburgh, 300 miles away, and that at the time was the greatest distance over which a call could be made. International dialing came in in March 1963, and the last Strouger-based exchanges were still operating until the mid-90s when they were disbanded. Of course, while all this was going on, radio was being developed. And radio, of course, allows communication without wires, and we all know how Marconi used the work of Maxwell and, and Hertz to produce experimental radio systems, and he demonstrated the first radio transmission from the post office headquarters to the savings bank in London in 1896. And we know, of course, that a few years later from Cornwall to St. John's in Newfoundland, the first radio-based transatlantic voice call, uh, sorry, Morse call was, was made. And all this led to it being possible to speak over long distances by uh, using radio because of the introduction of the thermionic valve. So we're seeing lots and lots of developments starting to come together. Of course, television was also developing. Baird successfully transmitted his first pictures in 1925. We launched a Sputnik in 1957, or rather the Russians did. And of course, um, it wasn't long before communication satellites started to uh, um, fly up in uh, orbit and uh, by the end of uh, this year in our region up in Manchester we will be entirely um, uh, digital with our, with our televisions. But of course the big development was in the 1940s when we saw the development of the stored program computer and of course last year we celebrated the 60th anniversary of the successful running of the um, baby machine in Manchester. And we have to remind ourselves of the important difference between the way that we developed the computers where we made everything digital, representing whatever it was inside the machine, a number, a word, or whatever, <coughs> using the simple logic of two values, the binary logic. But we are speaking analog. Right now, I'm speaking an analog, you're listening analog, I'm not doing anything clever converting anything into a digital format, you're not doing anything clever converting it back from a digital to an analog format, we're speaking analog. And we still speak analog, although we live in a, in a digital age. 
And of course, what computers have done is enabled us to develop a digital telephone network. Now, when Professor Lynch and I um, gave a talk up in, um, in February up in Manchester to the Northwest branch, we spent a lot of time telling them how the um, digital telephone network actually works. I'm not going to bore you with all that today. I'm just going to remind you that we didn't actually start digital telephone networking in this country until just over 40 years ago, the Empress Exchange in 1968 in, in London. The infamous System X digital um, telephone exchange network system was brought into service in 1980, so it's less than 30 years since we started modern digital uh, telephony, and it wasn't until 1990 that we went fully digital on a long distance telephone network in the, in the UK. Some of the advantages, of course, are that you can make many more calls over the network. Um, on today's typical pair of opt fiber optic cables, you can have 100,000 simultaneous uh, conversations um, going on. And you can have new services. You couldn't have your 1471 dial back, find out who's trying to get in touch with you. You couldn't have itemized billing. You couldn't have all this integrated service digital networking um, without the introduction of the computer logic into the telephone exchanges and that's been a relatively recent development and of course we've been developing all these computers and it wasn't long before we wanted to connect our computers together but as we know they're digital machines we do everything in ones and zeros the telephone system is actually designed to communicate speech the challenge is how do you use a telephone system, an infrastructure which already existed in order to enable us to get our computers talking to each other so that they could continue to communicate in the way that they wanted to but on an infrastructure that was not really designed to do it. Well, the digital over analog challenge came about because we had an electrical mechanical telephone network and it was designed to transmit the human voice which limits its utilization believe it or not to only four kilohertz that's all we need to speak is a bandwidth of four kilohertz and um, the challenge was how do we actually do it enter the modem the modem the modulator demodulated device that enabled us to actually take that digital information and send it in actually an initially an analog form over the telephone network where we could for example use a form of modulation say frequency modulation and allocate frequency bands to represent ones and zeros and even on the same circuit have two circuits representing ones and zeros so that we could have a full duplex standard something like the 21 so that we could send and receive at the same time across a um, uh, the telephone the wires in the telephone network so come on respond computer that's better so what we effectively developed in integrating the technology of telephony into the requirement to get computers talking to each other was effectively a digital analog digital sandwich. <clears throat> We've got and we have now the capability to actually convert the analog signals which come out of our telephones into digital representation so that we can actually use the digital telephone network to communicate and gradually we started to network and so why are networks so important well here's an interesting little graph for you I don't know whether you've seen it it's one we borrowed from the ITU it shows 
the percentage of the world population who are network users on, on the internet. And you can see over here quite clearly that it was very low till we get into the 1980s and into the 1990s and then the curve rockets. The number of people who now want to connect their computers together <coughs> is growing every second of every day. At the end of 2007, 2007, the latest figures that we have, we haven't yet downloaded all the stuff for 2008, 22.1% of the world's population, one and a half billion people, were internet users. <coughs> so let's go back to 1969 and remind ourselves what we were looking at then. Typical machines, like these uh, mini computers and uh, mainframe computers were being used and organizations like the Advanced Research Projects Agency in the States and people like Bob Taylor started to experiment with how can we easily send data between computers using these telephone lines. We know how to convert the data we know how to actually get something intended to transmit telephone conversations to actually allow us to send uh, computer data, but how can we do it a little bit more easily? Well, what was going on? Well, ARPANET had a lot of mainframe computers and uh, what they wanted to do was to have some message processors connected to the telephone lines which would enable them all to talk to each other. These interface message processors that they were using <coughs> were actually BBN supplied but based on Honeywell um, mini computers, $50,000 each. And Larry Roberts was looking at this challenge, how do we do it? And they announced ARPANET in 1967 in Tennessee. At the same time, Don Davis in this country and Paul Barron were looking at the problems of how do you, can you actually pack it up data to send between the systems? Because basically when we think of the analogy of us writing a letter, we write the letter, which is our data, we put it in an envelope or a packet and we put it in the mail. And that analogy was what they used to come up with the idea of breaking up data into a number of packets and sending those packets, normally in sequence, but if at any time one was lost, having some sort of control system, some sort of protocol that said, yep, I got one, two, and three, and that's where it stopped. Can you please send from number four? I didn't get that, and carry on. And the concept of packet switching as a means of communicating between computers over the telephone network started to develop. And in 1969, these first message processing machines were connected to form ARPANET. UCLA, their scientific data system, Sigma 7, in September. In October, the Stanford Research in Institute connected theirs, and the University of California at Santa Barbara followed in December with their 360, and uh, the University of Utah with their DEC PDP 11. And they s formed ARPANET. And this is the iconic diagram, which I'm sure that many of you have seen. The first ARPANET network, December 1969, connecting those four computers together. And of course, this was going to be the birth of the internet. It started to grow. By September 1971, it had crossed the United States. It uh, was connecting not just academic institutions, but some of the manufacturers. You can see BBM there, you can see um, Burroughs uh, there. 
It um, uh, allowed Ray Tomlinson to come up with the idea of sending information between people using something he called electronic mail with an addressing system that identified the destination by putting it after the little at sign, X at Y. So you can blame Ray Tomlinson for the at, at sign. And the whole thing started to grow and it's interesting that in 1973, 75% of all the traffic on ARPANET was email. It got bigger, more organizations started to um, uh, connect and um, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and uh, eventually it starts to go international and the bit highlighted in red there is where the connections were made across <coughs> the Atlantic via a machine in Norway to London. <coughs> so what were we doing back in the UK while all this was going on in the United States? Well Don Davis of course had continued his work on public on packet switching and he'd established MPLnet the GPO created the first public packet switching network, the EPSS, and some of you will remember that, and it was launched in 1977. It evolved into the X25 packet switch stream network, and uh, Peter Kirstein at uh, UCL, he started to consider how we could possibly connect ARPANET into the UK and this was going to be done by exploiting a satellite link at Norway's Seismic Research Centre to make UCL the first UK ARPANET node in 73 and this is how he did it. We connected to the USA from uh, Oslo via satellite, um, a link, a transoceanic link from Oslo to London and it enabled us to connect the Department of Industries Computer Aided Design Centre through a PDP-9 and the, um, to uh, their Atlas to um, uh, the ARPANET and Rutherford Appleton were able to connect their 36195 in the same way. So ARPANET goes international. First demonstrated at a conference at the University of um, Sussex and then the further link established at the end of that year. So it's 1973, only just over 25 years ago that we were connected to the ARPANET. But of course the inevitable happens. Different people had different views and what Professor Lynch and I talk about as the packet switching protocol wars started to take place. The telecoms companies and the uh, CCITT and the ITU wanted an approach which made the network as reliable as possible based on X25 standards for transmission and major networks were built by the world's telcos. And I have to put my hand up and say that when I was responsible for network design for, for, for Barclays, that was the decision I made. Make the network as reliable as possible. Didn't believe in having network failures. My uh, terms of reference to the team was the network must never stop, it must never fail, there must always, it must always be possible to get a route through it. And they did. But on the other side of the Atlantic, Vince Vinton Surf and Bob Kahn took the view that uh, perhaps we should make the network a bit more simple. And perhaps we should allow the end stations which were becoming more and more intelligent and more and more reliable, we should let them worry about reliability. And they developed an alternative protocol, stack, tran uh, uh, the Transmission Control Program Internet Protocol. And as you all know, that is actually what we use today and that was first adopted at the beginning of 1983 and that is the transmission control protocol that we use today. Some of us also talk over it because we have the capability of actually making telephone calls over the internet, voice over IP, VOIP as we, we call it. But it continued to grow and eventually in 1990 or from 1990, 
virtually morphed into the internet. And what is that internet? What have we actually got as a result of all these different developments? Well, the internet is a collection of networks. The national telco networks, government networks in this country like Janet, private networks like those of the major companies like the, the big banks, the big manufacturing companies, the um, airline industry, um, and of course now internet service provider networks who just exist to provide internet services. All connected throughout the world and all needing to connect through something we call exchange points and all now using the internet protocols. And in the UK the two major exchange points are in Manchester and, um, and London. Meanwhile, it was realised by Tim, Tim Berners-Lee, that it was all very well to have all these computers beautifully connected and able to talk to each other, but it would be great if it was a bit easier for them to talk to each other. The internet was connected using TCP IP, but uh, Tim came up with the notion that wouldn't it be good if somehow we could mark up the information using a form of hypertext so that it was a lot easier to be able to share that information. And of course that led to the requirement to develop a protocol to do that and hence the hypertext transfer protocol, HTTP, which until recently we all had to keep putting at the start of our internet addresses, didn't we, was developed. And that allowed him to start to develop the concept of a browser to read and format this, H this HTML structure that he'd come up with. He made his initial proposals only 20 years ago and uh, these, this led to the concept of the web, the World Wide Web. And we have great difficulty sometimes explaining to the youngsters the difference between the internet and the web. Of course, you all understand it. November 1990, he created his first browser, and of course, he's, um, he released that software onto the internet, and uh, right now, he's working on um, uh, improving it even more. So we now live in an IP world, and this is an interesting map. It shows the distribution of internet users throughout the world. And you can see where the, 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 clusters, uh, the clusters are. All this stuff is actually freely available on the um, web. You can get these, these pictures off of the, um, off of the um, web itself. But meanwhile, while all this was going on, the telephone started to integrate with advanced radio techniques and in particular exploited micro miniaturization of electronic components such that it was only in 1985 that the mobile phone arrived in the UK. And now, some 24 years later, it's changed the way that we all communicate with over 2 billion mobile phone subscribers worldwide. So, what's actually inside your mobile? I don't recommend you take them apart. We take some apart at the universities, but they're only for demonstration purposes. This is what's inside a typical mobile. That's the Sony T200, a little bit dated now. But you only have to analyse the block diagram to see that what's inside today's mobile is a very sophisticated computer system that is integrating all these technologies that we've been talking about. Computer systems, telephone systems, radio, radio te technologies. So that now that we can communicate using a mobile device, we can change the whole structure of the telephone concept. And communications now is personal. 
We talk about our mobile and it's our mobile. We carry it around with us. Some people carry more than one around with them, I know. Your phone at home is a fixed instrument. You don't carry it around with you unless you've got a big reel of cable to run, around, to run around after your car or when you're walking the dog. But it's got personal. It's carried by an individual and it's customised by the individual. It contains a lot of personal information. And this means that we can now deliver to mobile phones services and features which are tailored to the individual that owns them. No longer is it a piece of black paper like with a thing on the front that you dial round and a nicely woven cord that always got twisted and that was rather heavy, the old Bakelite phone, and um, you could have any model you liked so long as it was black and Bakelite. You can personalise it. You can put your own access codes in. You can secure it. You can change the external appearance. You can go down to your local market, and if you want to, you can put a new cover on it. You can do all sorts of things. You can change the ringtones. You can have your own address book in there. You can have information services. This is where our history has brought us. And what's more, the mobile provider knows exactly who you are and where you're located. That worries some people. But it allows us to have access to information. And never before in the whole of history have we had access to as much information as we have today and it's increasing all the time. We get telephone calls, text messages, email, the web images, television, radio, music, and um, it can now be possible to have the internet in our pocket with all the capability available via the net. And entertainment is now even more mobile. Earlier this year I had a problem on my phone the number five key wouldn't respond. And I went to the local O2 shop and I said, my five key doesn't work. And he looked at it, he said, that's an old one, sir. So I said, yes, I know. He said, how long have you had it? I said, I don't know. He said, hang on a minute, I'll look on the database. So he looked up the database and he said, did you know that nobody on the whole of the O2 system has had a phone of the same type for as long as you. <laughs> so I said, no. I said, does that mean I can have a free one? He said, yes. He said, so long as you continue with your contract, you can have a free one. So I said, well, what's the basic phone on my tariff? And it's in my pocket there, I won't get it out. And he got this thing out and he said, he said, it takes some. It's really good, he said, it's got an MP3 player on it and it's got an FM radio and um, it can connect to the net so you could actually watch television if you wanted to and you can, it's got two cameras on it and you can send email all over the place and you can do text messages. I said, but can I make telephone calls? <laughs> yes, he said, you can make telephone calls as well and it's an absolutely amazing thing. And we were just chatting, he said, oh, did I tell you about the GPS system on it as well? But it's also a sat-nav. And I got it for nothing, which is interesting. That is what all these developments we've been talking about has brought us to. So what is it today? What would it be for you? Is it your electronic passport? Is it your credit card? Is it your travel guide? Is it your personalised interface to all these services? Is it your personal multimeter communicator? Is it your route to cyberspace, that place that we now go to through the internet which put, gives us 24-hour news to feed us as society, that allows us to broadcast ourselves if we want to by going onto YouTube and Facebook and MySpace and, and uh, places like that. Interestingly, a survey recently identified that UK users spend an average of 5.8 hours a month on social networking sites alone. Well, someone must be spending 11.6 hours a month because I don't spend any time at all on social networking sites. We do our shopping, don't we? End of 2007 statistics, 
15% of all retail spend online. 4 million people spent their Christmas day in 2007 spending 84 million pounds on the web. And UK shoppers <coughs> between October and December 2007 spent 15.2 billion pounds using the net. And of course, the infamous Google found its way into the Oxford English Dictionary in June 2006. The definition to use the Google search engine to find information on the net. And Google's mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and, accessible and useful. They do over 150 million searches a day. Entertainment, web TV, BBC iPlayer, you're all used to it. And of course, the infamous email. We estimate that there are 210 billion messages sent each day. That is 32 for every person on the planet. 2.4 million every second as we speak, just like that. 70% of them, of course, are spam and waste our time. And here's some interesting demographics. Women aged 25 to 34 spend over 20% more time online than their male counterparts. These are Ofcom statistics. And silver surfers, that's us guys, <laughs> also account for an increasing amount of internet use with nearly 30% of total time spent on the internet accounted for by over 50s. Interesting, isn't it? But there are, of course, challenges. The latest challenge is can we build broadband uh, into Britain? 56% of households had broadband access in 2008. We've come a long way from the days of my old modem, David, which used to connect me to Janet. That is the machine, the little bit of technology that used to connect me into, into Janet, to the sort of wireless routers we have in our houses today. The Todd Morton Exchange started in 2002 to deliver a real broadband. We've got developments like ADSL, where we've got upstream lower capacity than downstream, supposedly one meg up, up to 12 megs down, but that of course depends on how far from the exchange you are and how many other people are trying to use it at the same time. We've got Virgin Media and companies like YMAX, iYMAX, all trying to sell us all this access. But um, more seriously, are there challenges using this network that history has allowed us to develop? How do we find what we want when the web contains more information than can be consumed in several lifetimes? How can we trust what we read? What do we do when the web becomes possibly our only source of um, information? Well, Tim and uh, colleagues at Southampton and others are doing a lot of work on the semantic web to replace HTML. Um, others are looking at uh, website kite marking to improve the quality. But how do you index and search multimedia content? Words and numbers are pretty straightforward. How do you search pictures? How do you search videos? How do you search images? Big challenges. And how do we account for um, uh, the social situation when we look at the distribution of um, the world's population that actually has access to the internet and we look at Asia and Africa and we see how low the figures are compared to the Americas and um, Europe and in the UK supposedly some 66% of the population have access to the internet and I can't remember which flag that is it's one of the Caribbeans it's either Bahamas or the Barbados flag um, they have the highest concentration of all 95% of the population have access to the internet there and of course we have to remember all the sorts of aspects about security. Who are you talking to? Do you really know who you're talking to? It's a very big place and uh, our private world meets the cyberspace world when we start connecting to these networks which, which go everywhere. And the area between reality and cyberspace starts to uh, learn. Some people have an existence now in another world, an artificial world. I'm, I don't go in for that sort of stuff, but you have to, you have to accept that that's happening. And the whole aspect of the new business models which 
our development of cause to happen. Who pays for it all? Who pays for it all in a culture where young people particularly believe that everything on the web should be freely available? Interesting discussion on the, um, on, uh, the discussion program, the big questions last, last sun Sunday, wasn't it, about, about this. Problems like uh, Napster and eBay. You know, who should pay? Who should pay for it? In any case, perhaps the biggest problem is evening oil. The problem of phishing, viruses, trojans, and all that attacking the network, attacking organisations. In other words, the challenge of cybercrime. And um, the comment made by McAfee: the economic downturn is proving a hotbed for global cybercrime. Governments should not put all their focus on economy, economic recovery at the expense of fighting it. Fastest growing area of criminal activity. Big, big challenge. And can the infrastructure scope cope? You've heard the stories when the census went online, the, um, one of the censuses, network crashed. Too many people wanted to look at it. Northern Rock website problems add to panic. It's going to happen again towards the end of October, um, uh, not October, I think, the end of January when you have to file your income tax returns online, and you get the panic then. But it's a problem. When we live in an online society, we need an infrastructure that can cope. The old telephone networks were able to cope. We need to make sure that our digital networks of today can also cope. And of course the politics, or well, the governments of the world want to control, censor, or even embrace the internet? Big questions, and Professor Lynch and I challenge some of the youngsters with these questions. So, what I've told you about is this. Some of the technology developments which has given us today's telecommunications capabilities, and it's great to actually reminisce about some of those developments and how they work together to give us what we've got today. But they've also led to lots of challenges which we still need to address, and that's why we up at the university believe that we have an obligation to continue to engage with the public, to trace the history of the technology developments that have given us those capabilities, to explain some of the science and engineering research that has enabled them to happen, like those developments we very briefly explored today, and to identify some of the opportunities and challenges arising from the developments in communications. Just let me tell you then that I'm, uh, I and Nigel are funded to do this. We have a program of events for the public, we have schools events, and we've developed a very innovative visitor information system in the Manchester Communicates Gallery at the Museum of Science and Industry. We have family telecoms days which encourage youngsters and and um, older children like us to experiment with hands-on. We've got a huge collection of telecommunications technology and demonstrations spanning well over 100 years of development. And um, if any of you are in Manchester in October or in the middle of March next year, come and see us. We'd be very pleased to see you. We do all these interactive lectures. There's a few pictures of some of us playing with models of the Chappé Telegraph uh, demonstrating how we transmit and um, uh, format um, images using um, different um, using um, different coloured balls, and um, we have this uh, interactive technology at the museum up there, which we've put together in order to support this new communications gallery, which traces the history of communications. So I've come full circle. And in the gallery up there, they have exhibits around the printed word, television, photography, telephony, radio, and all sorts of things. So, our ongoing program, which finishes um, the, um, the current funded bit at the end of this year, is taking all this material out into the schools, into the classroom. We're taking what we do out on a more national scale and we are able to offer a much greater range of interactive events for local schools and other organisations like progress clubs, rotary clubs and things like that. Nigel found this quote a little while ago 
It said societies can develop and advance only so far as they can develop a means of acquiring, recording and disseminating information. The progression from the earliest communities to highly organised industrial states is one long story of improved means of communication. We started back a long time ago. We technically started in 1837 and we now in 2009 with these wonderful iPhones and Blackberries and Blueberries or whatever they're called. We've come a long way. Technology has enabled us to become an always on, always online world. Thank you for letting me share some of our thoughts with you. If you want to get in touch with us, there's some contact details. We're always pleased to hear what other people have to say. David, thank you for letting us come and, and share some thoughts with you this afternoon. <laughs> 59 minutes. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> thank you, David. Uh, I'm sure there's a discussion. <laughs> Do you want me to leave this on? Yeah, uh, interesting enough, your comment about having me on this phone on Orange, I think I can most likely beat you. Not on Orange, on O2. Oh, O2, I see. Yeah. <laughs> I bought mine in 1999. And it's still going strong. It's still going strong. Yeah. And what's more, I get a bill from Orange for 42p, 75p, 30p a month. <laughs> and it, because that's how much I use it. I just use it when I come here. I call them up to say. Of course, it, such a trip. if they had a really, a really intelligent billing system, they'd realise it was costing them more oh, than, they, than, than they were receiving <laughs> to bill you. So they should just send you a nice letter and say thanks. <laughs> I've got a telephone story as well. Um, when I was on holiday last year, my phone stopped working. And I couldn't understand why, because I had plenty of money on, on the phone. So I took it into the O2 shop. And the chap looked at me and said, yes, you're not you cut off. And apparently, if you don't top it up in 999 days, yeah. <laughs> yeah. and the, the man in the shop didn't even know that. I'll tell you something else, gentlemen, if you've got an account with O2 that is billed directly to your credit card, they're one of the only companies that actually take account of the expiry date of the credit card. And when the expiry date runs out, they no longer bill the credit card and they cut you off. I've had two big rows with them over that. Following uh, the first time they did that to me, I explained to them how they could very simply change their system to um, avoid that and to avoid upsetting law customers. And I had, from a very senior source, in, in O2, an undertaking that they would not do that in future. So I got his name and I recorded the date of the conversation. And when it happened again, I got straight through and asked to speak to that person and said, it's happened again, you haven't changed your system, what are you going to do about it? And uh, he said, well, I thought I had. Yeah, there we are. But um, just as a word of warning, some of them actually do. And they just don't care, they've got no sense of loyalty these days to their customers. Yeah, I wasn't out of credit, I just hadn't actually put any money on it. I had, another, I had a, a nice little experience in, in, with my phone in, um, in, uh, uh, at Easter this year. My wife and I had the opportunity to go down to the Channel Islands and um, it was on Bank Holiday, uh, Easter Bank Holiday Monday. Absolutely beautiful day. We decided, we decided we'd take the, um, the boat over to Herm. I don't know if any of you know that. Absolutely beautiful place. And, and uh, we uh, we'd not been over to the island um, uh, for many many uh, years, and we'd never had the opportunity to go over in brilliant weather and walk round. And we were walking round the, the, the island, and I was we were right round the other side. Cliffs are up here, and she was over there, and, and she said to me, oh, you were going to phone Jane, that's our daughter, to tell us, yeah, okay, I've got the mobile. So I dialed, press a button, and I got this voice. No, that doesn't sound right. So I, and I realized what I'd got. So I listened again, and I was being politely told in French that the number you have dialed has not been recognized. <laughs> 
And what we'd done, because we were around the other side of the hills, we'd actually picked up a base station, because mine's on international roaming, I'd picked up a base station without realising it in France. So I then had to call her internationally from home. So, but isn't it wonderful? It, it's absolutely wonderful, isn't it? Um, we just go anywhere in the world and we press the button and it works. And, you know, we've got a lot to thank Alman B. Strouger for. <laughs> <laughs> When you're talking to children, have they got any appreciation for the relative bandwidth of things? Do they realise no. how many email messages you can get through for the price of a one-hour television programme? No. No, they, they, they have very, very little concept of that. And I have to tell you that nor do the, some of the mature... Yeah. I'm um, very worried pop, that the TV pop. will saturate the internet and the emails won't get through. Yeah, Ab absolutely. So maybe... So maybe the answer is to learn how to toast. And substitute new technology, which we don't. Uh, sorry, I'm going to butt in with my two bits of anger yeah. on this business. Not against you, but against how telecommunications have developed, not as well as they should have done. Yeah. First of all, computers developed to a stage where we didn't have to share them and save them anymore, because they became so fast, so reliable, that you can sit there and do nothing most of the time. You could buy the computer, and you waste it, right? Now, the same technological resolution, the of communications, is called fiber optics. Yes, that's absolutely right. Where, where if you're using proper <coughs> modern cables, you've got more bandwidth than you know what to do with, but you don't on the commercial internet, you've still got the bloody ADSL stuff. Absolutely. Because the last mile home has not been tackled it's by the That's right. The, um, I, I, I the was a government room. body it's which had to recommend, back in the mid-1980s, recommended initiative for broadband, what we call what we call it, yes. and if it had been a Labour government, we would have advised the British Telecom, or whatever it was called in those days, just to put the money in and do it, yeah. but it wasn't, no. it was a Labour government, a Conservative government, so we couldn't advise that, we had to devise a commercial model, so get cable TV working, we failed because it was too big an investment for the private sector. Yeah, and, and it's, uh, there, there are other factors, of course, on that, because um, um, I, live, um, I live in an old silk town in southeast Cheshire, the little town of Congleton, and it is small by many, by many um, standards. I think we still only got about 22,000 people who live there, so it's a pretty tiny place in many respects. And um, I got quite excited, um, oh, it must be over 10 years ago, because um, I saw on the main... A34, which runs about 150 yards from where we live, cable contractors with their specialised, you know, excavators and cable laying equipment, laying fibre optics. And um, it was, uh, I went and saw the guy who looked to be in charge, the foreman, and he was doing, he said, doing it for cable and wireless service. So I said, right. I said I, know, I said, I know someone in cable and wireless, um, um, I'll, I'll talk to them, because the question I asked him was, when are you coming down the street? Oh no sir, we're not coming anywhere, we're just coming through Congleton. We, we've been told we've got to connect Bidolf to Macclesfield. So I said, oh right. So I phoned my mate in, in, in cable and wireless and said, oi, your, call, your blokes are causing traffic chaos in Congleton, laying all these fibre optics, and we're not even going to get any benefit out of it because they say that all they're doing is connecting up a cable that comes north from Stoke up to Macclesfield. Yes, that's right, he said. I said, well, why aren't you coming to Congleton? He said, you've got the wrong socio-demographic profile. <laughs> I said, well, what the hell do you mean by that? He said, well, not enough of you sit there watching the shopping channels. <laughs> not, in, not enough of you sit there prepared to pay premium prices for films. And so, you know, you know it's, it's, as David says, it's these commercial things that start to get in the way of the development of the infrastructure. Now, the Congleton Telephone Exchange is no longer in Congleton. It's a little bit of circuitry tucked on the end of the racks of all the equipment, the other side of Macclesfield. Guess what that means for those of us who'd like to have a decent broadband service? Too far away. <laughs> yeah, it's only just beginning to reach at times uh, uh, on a good day um, um, a mega. 
I don't bother to use it. I'm, it. It's easier for me to get in the car, drive 27 miles to the university, and use our um, uh, sort of subnet of Super Janet. Um, the problem I have with the computer is that it's not fast enough for the network. Our, 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 our university network mm. can drive uh, about 4,000 devices simultaneously at 100 megabits a second. It's never, we never have to wait. It's, <coughs> it's just like that. It's all fiber optics, of course. It's absolutely fantastic. So the best use of, of, of my time sometimes is to get in the car, drive to the university, get what I want, and drive home again. Well, why are we so well, well so David says it's, it's, the, it's the local it's loop. The yeah, local it's not the local loop. It's the government that decides what they're going to put them out. But there are, there are limits to the technology. Yeah. In the like local Britain have been announced, <laughs> and they say they want to make every household two megabits by yeah. 2000. Yeah. 2000. Two megabits is yeah. broadband. Two, two megs is That's nothing. It. That's right. It's not broadband. I mean, two megabits these days is like um, those of us who were really chuffed a bit when we had a 1,200 bit a modem, modem yeah, that yeah, allowed yeah. us to connect to Janet to do short emails. Yeah, well, the other hand, that megabit might be okay, but if the websites I was looking at weren't all based with pictures. Oh, absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, the New technology enables you to do things you could never do before. Agreed. And that's what you want to do. Yeah. You know. But, but you do need to have some of these some of these websites uh, are very yeah. inefficient. Yeah. Can I just bring in? It may not be a totally true story, but a work for a department of Nortel. They put a proposal together many years ago that was just a little box that went into the cabinet in down the end of your street mm -hmm. and fiber optic back. Yep, to that's it. Yeah, that's so it. The, 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 the local loop was only a few hundred yards. And they were quite, at that stage, we were very happy with the forms that come out of that. Yeah. But they said we'd lose our income. Yeah. Yes. BT would lose its income if we did it. It's called cable TV. Cable well, TV uses more modern technology. I'm on cable TV. I don't watch TV. No, I but use you cable TV use a as a radio connection. I have 20 yeah. megs. You use my use a cable modem. Yeah. They probably yeah. don't exist in my world. Yeah. Because I'm on cable TV. Yeah. Use a cable modem. I had that. NTL was so poor they let me down so many times I got off it. Well, there is there's also a but Virgin seems to have felt great. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And as you say, those was an academic community. They have a proper network. Yes, we do. We'll always have that. Yeah. The last class last April. <laughs> The question on mobile phones, my understanding is that the mobile phone network again is entirely commercial yes. and that means that you can go to cheerful places where you would like to dial 999 because you're drowning in some pond and there is absolutely no signal because no one has responsibility providing a universal signal yeah. across the totality yep. of the UK, let alone further afield. It's one of my favourite activities on the um, <coughs> on the, the Virgin trains. I, I travel from Crewe to London quite regularly and, um, and one of the problems with travelling on Virgin Pendolinos and Voyagers is that they're pretty strong trains. Um, uh, this, happened, this was evidenced by that terrible crash that happened up in the lakes. You know, the whole thing stayed as an integrated, um, you know, it, it, uh, it, it, it stayed intact. That's because there's a lot of metal around you and of course if we go back to our basic physics we know that what we're traveling in is a bit of a Faraday cage really so we, we, we start at a, at a loss in any case but the Virgin trains are now actually traveling faster than the mobile network's ability to transfer you from cell to cell. Now I get fed up with, with, with these people on, who, who have this um, appendage to their ear all, all the time. And I love it with someone sitting opposite me who says, oh, well, I've lost a signal. And I say, would you like me to explain why that is? <laughs> <laughs> and normally I can engage them in a conversation all the way to Crewe or to Houston. And it's much better than hearing them say, I'm going to be another, now I'm going to be another, oh, oh, you know. But um, it, it's, it's a real problem. That, that is a big problem, the switching, because the cells are so small. And the smaller the cells, of course, the easier it is to triangulate and identify um, where we are. What, what of course, um, and some people say, oh, well, why don't we use satellite signals? The problem is we haven't found a way yet of getting satellite signals to penetrate the likes of these sorts of buildings, but the signal, the frequencies we use for mobile phones sort of go almost anywhere. 
And of course, the big new development for you folk in London, you're going to be able to use your mobiles on the underground soon, aren't you? Mm. So you've been able to do no. Moscow for many years. Yeah. 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 But won't that be great? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the underground. Yeah. yeah, I'm on the train, yes. I'm on the train. I've just left Arnest Grove. <laughs> <laughs> Don't blame me. That's the Milton Keynes. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting what you said about people not knowing the difference between the internet and the World Wide Web. And uh, it's apocryphal to, to mention that um, last time Southampton University won the University Challenge, not last Monday, but the previous year, it was introduced as the home of Tim Berners who invented the internet. Mm -hmm. So he applied to write for from there and then. Yeah. So, so Hamilton was on again last Monday, and he got it right this time. So somebody has not. <laughs> so someone would have, would have, would have told. No, well, I mean, uh, Jeremy. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Yes. All fun stuff. Yeah, it's all interesting. It's all in, in interesting stuff. Um, we 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 have some great fun with um, with, with, with 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 the children. Um, um, and with and with the um, and with the grown ups as um, as well, and it really is um, the one thing that always is very very popular at our um, family telecoms days is the simplest thing of all. Uh, we have a whole load of tin cans. <laughs> string. string. We don't actually use string. <coughs> um, uh, I. Um, um, I experimented with this, and if you um, if you want to do it, I can recommend to you 100 pound breaking strain C angling line, not the nylon, the not the the the, um, uh, the braided stuff. Bright orange. Um, we talk about having uh, two tin cans and a bit of wet string, so we say that's why we use the, the angling line, but it's great. It gives you a real good um, signal-to-noise ratio. It really does. It's fantastic. And of course, if you get the knots right um, um, through the hole in the end of the, the, the tin, they, they can pull it as hard as they like. And of course, they don't believe what you can do with these things till we act, two of us actually stretch them and you pluck that string. <laughs> and you know the noise uh, is, is absolutely incredible. But the tin can and string, we found to be one of the most effective ways of explaining to youngsters why a telephone actually works. And um, even the grown-ups uh, seem to have um, appreciated. Um, if you go to um, the supermarket um, and uh, you want to look for tins to do this with, um, turn them upside down. And my wife gets fed up with me doing this. Um, no, you can't buy that, darling, because you've got the wrong shape on the bottom. You know they reach the tins at the bottom. They put the, the, the circles. You need something nice and wide. Otherwise, you don't get so much vibration. And she gets really upset with me in the supermarket. And I say, no, no, you can't buy those plum tomatoes because that tin's not as good as that. We'll have these. Um, but yeah, it's great. It's um, it, it it really is. Um, um, a, we found that to be very very useful. Um, uh, um, and um, we take it f from there. We show them their voices on oscilloscopes. We show them how we we show them their voices modulated on infrared, down fiber optics, um, visually, and so on. We do all these sorts of things with them, and they they, they learn so much. So do the adults. And sometimes, you know, it's a little bit like. Um, um, I used to moan when I could go into sort of Dixon's or somewhere like that. I could never get anywhere near the latest technology for the kids. Mm. Sometimes mm. the kids can't get anywhere near our experiments for the grown ups. <laughs> but here we are. But it's, it's good fun. Yes? Uh, I'd like to ask, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Thank you. I, I'd like to ask if this the presentation which you've just given can actually be viewed on the internet. Um, oh, sorry, the world wide web. <laughs> um, well, um, we, uh, it, it, it might be possible to do that. I think you'd need to perhaps have a, a chat to, um, to Professor Lynch um, to make sure that he's happy with uh, some of the material. But some of the lectures that um, we've given are available because... Sorry? Yeah, just go on there. And from there you can, you, you can get a link 
through to um, some of the lectures we've given. Um, uh, a few years ago, for example, um, Nigel and I did um, a Royal Institution type lecture for the <coughs> IET Christmas lecture in, in the north. That's on IET TV. And some of our stuff is on YouTube. You know, we've put little snippets up there. So there's quite a lot up there. If you go to that website, you'll find loads of links through. Um, there are PowerPoints of some of it. Some of it is up there on the um, um, on things like IET TV and yes, yes. This one, um, how quickly it'll be on the web? I don't know. He's recorded it. <laughs> well, you don't put it on the web. Another comment. There was talk about the technology and the how that marches on. One of the influences in the growth of all this electronic communications is, is regulation. And we've now got a whole regulated industry with European yeah. regulation driving it. Do you comment on, any comments on that? Well, my original career was in banking. Do you want me to leave now? <laughs> I actually am a, a qualified banker. I'm not licensed to practice, but, but, I, but I do. Um, bank yes. without, the bank without bonuses. Uh, yes, a banker without bonuses, yes. No, I'm one of those um, rare individuals who actually um, uh, uh, qualified in, in banking. And the way that I would answer that is to, is to use the banking analogy. Um, we all like the idea of being able to take, say, a cheque that's been given to us, drawn on a branch of HSBC, to... We all like the idea that we can take that cheque into a branch of, say, Lloyd's TSB for the credit of our account at Barclays, and in any combination. We all like the idea that that bit of plastic that we carry around in our pocket can, although it was issued by, say, Barclays, we can put into a machine from Nationwide or in the Marks and Spencer store or wherever and get some money. The only reason that that can all happen is because there are regulations which govern things like the formatting of the messages and all the information and the size of the card and things like that. So regulation can have real advantages. And the money transfer system that we enjoy in the UK and indeed worldwide would not exist without some form of regulation. My belief is that if we're going to have a free exchange of information, if we're going to have an information transfer system, we also need to accept that there needs to be some regulation in the form of standards and procedures and so on for doing that. But if I come back to my analogy with, with um, um, banking, one of the uh, things that allows us to put a Barclays card in a Lloyd's machine um, and, and so on is that actually those networks are very, very secure. I know they're secure because I was privileged to be on the working party in the um, early days which designed secure networks so that banks could talk to each other securely. And you can go back in history and you will never find an example of a link between two banks being hacked. Now, have you ever put your card in a machine and all of a sudden found that you get a message that says, um, we're sorry, but we cannot continue with the transaction at the moment. Would you please retrieve your card and start again? Has that ever happened to you? Yeah. Yes? Can I personally apologize? <laughs> <laughs> it's part of the security system. Um, I generated a particularly low random timeout on that occasion, I do apologise. <laughs> we were always concerned that someone with a great big mainframe might be able to hack in and try every combination. I mean, they use enormous now, 256 big, big keys now. <coughs> but the key changes for every transaction. Even if you say, I want the balance, and then I want cash, that's two transactions, and the key will actually change between those two. And what we put in was a random timeout so that the crooks had no idea how long they had. And sometimes the random number that we generate might be a bit low. So what happens is it, it, it doesn't get a response within the timeout, so it says start again. Um, and 
we put all sorts of clever security tricks in, in, into that network. And I think what the internet needs is some serious security. <coughs> I will not have an online bank account. That's how secure I regard the net. <coughs> I will not have an online bank account. And I worked on the security systems that enable banks to talk securely together. But now that they use the internet, no way. It's not secure enough in my view. It's too easy for people to get in. And I actually believe that um, the software providers um, have got to learn a lot to own up for. Of course, you know about the problem on the, uh, remember, you probably don't remember this. Um, it was, uh, was it October 2004, I think, when um, Abbey National, as it was then, their online banking system, they had a very interesting um, marketing feature. Um, it was available for less than an hour uh, because fortunately it was found, but if you had a valid account on their um, banking system, you could log on and you could have a good mooch around your own account you could transfer money and all sorts of things and then you could go and do it to other people's <laughs> why? because someone had allowed an automatic update from a, one of their suppliers to be installed and that automatic update cancelled out mm -hmm. the security routines that were in place so it didn't matter what you put in, you could have just gone ID, password, and you'd have been in. It's dangerous. It's very, very dangerous. I think that the, uh, the physical side of it is okay, the software side of it, I think we've got a long, long ways to go. Long, long ways to go. But if we're going to have real secure networks, we've got to be able to transmit lots and lots more information. And to transmit lots and lots more information, we need lots and lots more bandwidth. We need these fiber optics. Because we won't do it over copper wires. There we are, in any case. That's me. Mm -hmm. Last question. Yes, sorry. Lady? I just wondered if you use telephone banking. We have a telephone banking um, um, option available to us. My wife and I have, um, have um, a premier banking relationship with Barclays. Um, not for telephone banking, not for the internet banking, for things like travel insurance and um, all those other things. You know, we, we pay, um, as, as retired staff, we, we pay far less than customers pay for Premier Banking. And we get all sorts of things like free RAC membership, um, uh, free travel insurance, free servicing when the, the, uh, if, the if, we, if we get a water leak, all that sort of thing. It's really great. It costs me less than 150 quid a year. So yes, we've got the opportunity, but uh, I never, I never use telephone banking. I do buy things on the internet, and I'll tell you something. Just let me tell you something, David. You might want to think about this. Like you, I've got a wallet full of them. In fact, I've got two wallets of them. But that card is never used for anything other than online purchases and the company knows it. That card is never used for anything other than hotels, airlines, railway things and restaurants. Okay? That is never used for anything other than motoring expenses. <laughs> and this one is used, the Marks and Spencer one is used at Marks and Spencer and Sainsbury's and Tesco's and that. And all of those companies know that. And in the mid 80s we, uh, at Barclays, we worked on a thing called um, uh, Fraud Watch. You know about Fraud Watch? Which um, we used some intelligent systems, um, some expert systems software to the idea what, that we had was can we look at what the pattern of purchases is that the card holders have? And if you get something outside of that pattern, can we query it in case it's possibly fraudulent? And um, now we did it offline and it was so successful that we did it online and all the banks um, do that. It's why you get the phone call now again to verify a transaction because it looks out of um, 
Maybe use the wrong card, I would say. No. <laughs> no. 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 You, you, it's really important if you decide if you decide to do that as we've decided. It's really important that you you um, you stick with it, and it is a way of helping yourself. It's also good business for the card companies because you end up with more cards, um, and they 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 like that. But it's just a thought, you know. That's from a practicing banker. Right. Just a quick one. In other countries, you can get a text message every time a credit card is used. Yeah. The banks in this country won't do it for some reason. Well, I don't know why, sir. <laughs> I've got no idea why, but um, uh, it's a very simple method of checking that you know, somebody is using your yeah. credit card. Yeah, well, works for me. Do they? Yeah. It's that easy to do. Very, very simple to do. Well, yes. We, we can talk about these things all day. We go there. I'm going to chance privilege to use my winch. <laughs> I'm not going to let you reply to it. Okay. It's a serious one. My bank, I go on my banking, guarantees to me that if I, I lose anything to on my banking, they will refund it. I did lose something recently because the bank stole something from me. The <laughs> bank, and they will not refund it. And I'm taking it to the office. Quite right. Quite right. Quite right. Anyway. But, but what I would say, guys, is if you're going to use online banking, read the small print. Because most of them say that if you have not installed all the security updates relating to the operating system and the browser that you use, and all those sorts of things, if your system was not fully up to date with security software at the time that it occurred, they wipe their hands of it. That's because to be a successful banker, you lend large amounts, small amounts of money at large rates of interest, and you give small amounts of interest on large amounts of money. <laughs> David, can I thank you for a very comprehensive? Thank you, David. A very educated, and above all, amusing. Thank you. Thank you very much.